So I uh, got this idea from Pastor Kevin Myers from 12, 12 Stones Church out in uh, Georgia, and I thought, what a fantastic idea, what a fantastic premise that we all get dared to do dumb things in this life. And wouldn't it be cool to dare you to do something smart? Like I was dared to do dumb things. Anybody, uh, well, you don't have to admit it. But I played spin the bottle once <clears throat> in high school. And I didn't know who it was going to be, but somebody was standing in a dark closet and I had to go kiss them. And that was the dare. Kind of dumb. I got dared <clears throat> in January, I grew up in Canada, thin layer of ice over this pool. I got dared to jump in the pool. And I did it. Kind of dumb, kind of hurt breaking through the ice, actually. <laughs> uh, how many of you have ever been dared to do something? Put up your hand. How many of you have ever been dared to do something dumb? Put up your hand. Okay. How many of you have dared somebody to do something dumb? <laughs> wow. I appreciate your transparency. That's fantastic. Well, I was dared to do something a few weeks ago. Many of you saw the video. I'll, get, I'll share you a 10-second snapshot. James, I double dog dare you to go skydiving, to jump out of a perfectly good airplane. You can do this. I believe in you. So I had to do something about it, and I, I needed to do something that would set this whole series off just on the right step, to be on a smart path in, in 2018. So here's how it, I mean, here's how I went down. jumped out of my first airplane. <sighs> you, you didn't actually think I was going to jump out of a perfectly good airplane at 10,000 feet. It, it, that would be, that would be just dumb. And that would defeat the whole premise of this series that we're doing. Why, when we dare people to do things, is it always dumb? Well, we want to dare you in 2018 to do something smart. We want you to help you improve your physical life. We want to help you and dare you to get emotionally whole. We want to dare you to get healthy in your marriage, to get improving in your family and your parenting. We want to help you take the next step in your career and your finances, and we're going to look to somewhere that is smart, and that is God's Word that speaks into every area of our lives. So we want to dare you to be smart in 2018. Now, as for Alex's dare for me to jump out of a plane, listen, my life insurance doesn't cover jumping out of planes, but Alex, I talked to your parents. They took out this massive policy on you, and it covers jumping out of a plane. I don't know if they're thinking early retirement or what, but Alex, you're all good. You don't have any kids. So Alex, I double dog dare you to jump out of a plane before next Sunday. So come back next Sunday, and let's see what Alex does with this dare. And I dare you to do something smart in 2018. I double dog dare you. So the purpose of this series is to do something smart in 2018 in a world that dares you to be dumb. How many people believe and, and agree with that statement in general? Like our culture dares you to be dumb, right? Do this, do that, do this. Now, you're going to hear five dares over this five-week series. And we're, we're, we're daring you this morning in the area of health. And then next week, emotions, marriage, parenting, grandparenting, and career. And my challenge to you this this year is to pick at least one of those to run with and, and you're going to hear me unpack these and, and if you pick more than one that's okay too but 
Try to focus on at least one and, and run with that dare in 2018. So we're going to do an applied systematic theology study as we look at how God's word speaks into our lives in these areas. After all, if your faith does not dare you to live different, what's the point? What's the point? So today, week one, we dare you to get healthier. So grab your sermon outline notes there in your bulletin, pull them out, and you can follow along. And, and uh, number one is, or at the top, is truth. We're going to look at a truth every week. And the truth this week is the fact that our bodies are from God. Our bodies are from God. You can idolize it, abuse it, or care for it, but the quality of life rarely rises above what conquers you. Kind of common sense there, but let's look at Genesis chapter 1. It says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. There's three words in there. They're the exact same words. Let's say them together. Created, created, created. Turn to your neighbor and say, you were created by God. And God don't make junk. That's just, that's just the truth that you were created by God. Whether you believe it or not doesn't change the truth. Just like gravity, even if you don't believe in gravity, I don't see anybody floating. The truth is that gravity exists. The truth is that you were created by an incredible, uh, creative, purposeful God. You were created as a spiritual being and, and wrapped with this physical body. And God loves you and he wants to connect with you. And even though we're sinners and we fall short of God's expectations, and for him, he made a way for us to come to him. He sent Jesus to die on the cross. And then Jesus rose three days later, defied death. We don't have to fear death. And Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, advocating for us on our behalf. And the presence of God in your life and mine is offered through the person called the Holy Spirit. That's God's Spirit. If you're a follower of Christ, God's Spirit dwells in you. So your body is not your own. Your body is not your own. First Corinthians 6, it says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Remember, the Spirit of God dwells in you as a child of God. Uh, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own. You were bought with what? You were bought with a price. Christ paid for you with his life. So glorify God in your body. So do me a favor because we need to get this because I know it's common sense, but sometimes common sense isn't so common, right? So turn to your neighbor, turn to your neighbor and remind them that your body has an owner. Turn to your other neighbor and say, your body has an owner. And now tell both of your neighbors, and it's not you. There's some heavy implications if we absolutely understand that and agree to that. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you come under the authority of what God says to you about your body. If you're not a follower of Jesus, you're off the hook. <laughs> But I encourage you, listen to what God says to his people, because when God says something, even if somebody who doesn't believe makes it a part of their life, you will be blessed. And I dare you, I dare you to make that happen in your life. Now, there are three general categories that people fall into with regards to their bodies. Three just very general categories. You'll agree with these. You see this. You idolize it, you abuse it, or you care. For your body, you idolize, abuse, or care. Now, our passions and appetites, that's our battleground for us with regards to our bodies. Every day, the world dares you to indulge in more food, especially certain types of food that you only need a little bit of. And, and, and God blesses us to enjoy it, especially those sweet treats, those salty and greasy, amazing types of food. Anybody hungry? Put up your hand. I'm hungry. Yeah. And when you indulge in too much of certain types of food, you are literally misusing something that is good. You're misusing something that is good. Then your passions in your body will enslave you instead of serve you, which it is designed to do. Your body is a gift to serve you in your purpose as you serve God. 
Now, you can also idolize your body and be consumed with fitness. You can be consumed with um, what you look like. You can be consumed with fashion. And how do you know when you cross the line? Well, are you making yourself look good so people look at you, or are you making yourself look good so people look at God? What is your motivation? What is your why for why you got up this morning and did something about your bedhead? Is it about you or about God? You see, beauty starts from the inside first. Pursuing praise of your beauty must start internally. Look at Proverbs 31. It says, charm is deceitful. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. You don't fear. You don't give honor. You don't give respect. You don't give so much of your time and attention to charm and to beauty because you're deceived. What is deceptive about it? Well, because of your charm and beauty, you will get noticed, especially in this world. When you look at somebody, for example, when you look at somebody walking on the red carpet, do you notice their fear of the Lord first or their beauty externally? We look external. That's what man looks at. And we can worship appearance. And there's millions and millions and millions of dollars that are purchased with regards to beauty products and makeup. And we can go and bow down at the altar of these beauty products on an annual basis. It'd be an interesting comparison how much on average, especially Christians, give towards beauty products versus giving towards what is important to God. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with putting mousse in your hair or makeup on, but God is saying that if your priority in your life is your external beauty versus your internal beauty, then you have certainly been deceived. You have certainly been deceived. Let me ask you this. When you get up in the morning, what's the first thing you do? Do you attend to your external beauty first or your internal beauty? At the beginning of your day, the first thing you do, do you attend to your external? Are you fixing your bedhead? Or are you spending time with the Lord? What's your priority? All right. If anybody needs Band-Aids for their toes, we'll get you some after the service, because I know I stepped on a few toes. And and, and it's, it's a common sense question, but it's an important question, because beauty is vain. Charm is deceitful. Look in 1 Samuel 16. 1 Samuel 16. It says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the what? On the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the on the heart. The Lord looks on the heart. So what's your priority? Is your priority the Lord's priority? First Timothy 4 8, it says, For while bodily training is of some value, there is some value in bodily training, in taking care of this body that you were given as a gift to steward by your creator. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So when you're in bodily training, you need to keep it within context of godly training. Amen? There's nothing wrong with taking care of your body. There's nothing wrong with taking care of your bedhead or your breath. Thank you for doing that, by the way. But do it within context to praise God, to point people to God. I heard... That from ages 20 to age 50, the average person eats for about 20,000 hours. That's about 800 days. That's 800 good days. Come on. How many of you like to eat? Okay. We probably all like to eat. And in days and times when we eat, they should be celebrated. We should be praising God and enjoy the gift of the food that he gives us. And the Bible encourages us to celebrate the food that is gifted by God in honor of God. And and, and why? Because a lot of friendships are developed over food and coffee, right? A a lot of family relationships are developed over food. That's why at at dinner time, turn your stinking screens off and eat together. I mean, you will not die if you turn a screen off for 45 minutes and have dinner with your family. Can I get an amen? Amen. 
Okay, you can do this to your family member. Come on, that's all right. That's all right. That's, that's good. It's, it's, it's good. Food is good. Now, you should eat and celebrate the food God blesses you with, but don't allow it to conquer you. Don't allow it to conquer you. Don't allow it to own you. Don't get bullied by that greasy piece of bacon. Don't get beat up by that perfectly made carrot cake or that third piece, what have you. Don't allow them to control you because it will lead you to what the Bible terms, it starts with a G and ends in utney. Gluttony. Are you familiar with that term? It's eating too much of something. You know what? Even eating too much of carrots isn't good for you. It doesn't matter what it is, but we have a proclivity, a lot of us, to eat certain types of food, you know, salty, sugary, greasy, processed. Let's look at Philippians 3. It says, for many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. And then he starts describing these who walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is their destruction. Their what? Their God is what? Their God is their belly. Yes, we need nutrition. We need a certain amount of nutrition to eat. But sometimes we let our cravings, sometimes we let what we want to be our God. Their God is their belly and their glory and they glory in their shame. With talking about glory and their shame, I remember seeing uh, a commercial or something about this place in Vegas. It was like called Heart Attack Burger or something. Have you heard of that? Yeah, and we, that's glorying in our shame. Their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And for, I think in that news article, too, they were talking about how somebody did have a heart attack after they ate there. Crazy. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body. Can I get an amen on that? Your body is going to transform one day soon, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So when you abuse your body or when you idolize your body, when you get it outside the, con the, 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 the concept and the context of glorifying God in your life, the quality of your life drops. It simply does. If you idolize or abuse your body, you will reap the challenges. You will reap the emptiness that comes as a result. See, you have one body through which you experience life, as far as I know. Anybody have more than one body? Anybody? No, we all have one body through which you experience life. Again, common sense. Improve your health, improve your life. We need to improve your health to the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Because it's not your body. You don't own it. So caring for your body, what exactly does that mean? There are millions of different diets and, and, and food programs out there and exercise programs out there. Which is the right one that will keep me from abusing or going too far and idolizing my body. Well, in short, what it means to care for your body is to conquer your appetites. To conquer your appetites and to point people to God. That's the essence. Your quality of life rarely rises above what conquers you. When you physically get fit, it changes you. Have you noticed that? When you physically get fit, it, it changes more than just your physical makeup. Hey, you get more energy more strength, more stamina, your emotional state changes, your relationships change. When you feel crappy physically, how do you relate to others? Let me change this around. If you are here with a friend or a loved one, when your friend or loved one is physically feeling crappy for whatever reason, how do they relate to you? Positive, negative? For me, I whine. I can whine when I'm physically just feeling, you know, bad. So it, it, it matters more than just your physical body. Caring for your body is a spiritual issue. You and I were created to work in a garden. Did you know that? Adam and Eve, when they were created, they weren't placed in a chair and, and they weren't flying desks. They were created in a garden. And they did not sit in a cushy seat with four wheels under it, and that took them everywhere. They walked everywhere. 
They walked everywhere. Jesus and the disciples, they walked everywhere in the Holy Land, up and down, up and down hills, up and down hills. They put their physical bodies to work and walked everywhere. And I believe we need to do that as well. Our bodies were designed to move, to be in motion. When you go to the mall, do you park in the closest parking spot to the door? Park farther away. Walk. Park farther away and say, praise the Lord for this empty spot a mile away from the door. Woo! Instead of getting all uptight and stressed as you fight for the parking spot closest to the door. But for many of us, we need to be smart about this too. And you need to listen to your doctor because there are seasons in your life where you shouldn't be in motion because you're healing from something. And so you shouldn't be in too much motion. So Common sense here, follow your doctor's instructions. But for many of us, we just need to get moving. So here's the first dare of this series. First dare of this series, I dare you to conquer what conquers you. Conquer what conquers you, and we dare you to get healthy. We dare you to get on a healthy path in 2018 because you don't own this body. God owns it, and you want to bring glory to him, not to yourself, but to him through getting healthy, to getting his body healthy, get in shape. What might this look like in 2018? I want to give you a quick idea. Here, check this out. I hope that helps you with the dare. You kind of keep, gets your mind moved, you know, in, in, in context of what you need to do. I want to invite you to turn to Romans chapter 8. If you got your Bible, turn to Romans chapter 8. Scroll to Romans chapter 8 in your Bible app. Um, I'm going to put my hand up and say, yeah, gluttony is a challenge with me. Uh, I eat a lot of the wrong stuff, and especially at the wrong time. Like after 7 p.m., I can mindlessly eat greasy and sweet things until the cows come home. I'm telling you. How many of you are good at eating mindlessly? Put up your hand. We, so many of us do it. We just start eating. I mean, Doritos, they just go down so easily. They're amazing. Uh, chocolate and sweets from Christmas. I mean, oh, yeah, bring it on. And, and it's so amazing going down. But I eat too many too often. Now, naturally, I run with high cholesterol. It's just part of my genes for whatever reason. And so I need to be aware and careful of not adding to that challenge. So I can be around here a long time. So I can be here and, and walk my daughter down the aisle. So I can be here and get to know my grandkids, even my great-grandkids. That would be incredible. And so um, I have to be careful. You have to be careful with this body that we don't own. And, and we can be tempted by this food and the wrong food and too much of it. Let's look at Romans 8, uh, verse 1. Verse 1, it says, there is, there, these aren't going to be on the, on the screen except for the last verse, so please open your Bible, follow along. I want you in your word of God. I want you to get used to this. And by the way, my hope and prayer is that the only time you open your word of God that you have is not here on Sunday morning. My hope and prayer is that you do this on a daily basis. My hope and prayer is that you do it first thing in the morning. I don't care how tired you are. God's worth it. Amen. Get into his word, set your alarm for 10 minutes early and, and, and pull your tired butt out of bed and get into his word, get on your knees and spend some time with the Lord. A Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I'm not here to condemn anyone and nobody here should be looking down on anyone and to condemn anyone. That's not our job. That is sin. Look down at verse 3. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Jump to verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give you life. Everybody say life. Come on and say it better than that. Life. Even better, life. He will give you life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. He will give you eternal life if you come to him. He will give you eternal life in heaven if you want it. If you don't want it, he won't give it to you. It's up to you. But he also wants to give you this mortal life to the full. Right now, if we follow him and put his principles first, especially in this area and in the area of health. Verse 31, jump down to verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, everybody say, God is for me. God. Say, God is, for me. God is for me. Even when you don't eat that third piece of cheesecake because you want to honor God, he's still for you. He's still for you. If God is for us, who can be against us? 
He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. That's how much God is for you. He loves you so much that he gave Jesus. How will he not also with him graciously give us a couple things? It says all things. It says all things. Jump to verse uh, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Here's what's gonna be on the screen, verse 37. No, in all these things we are more than what? We are more than conquerors through him. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. The power of Jesus is greater than what we usually recognize or acknowledge in our own life. Often we look at things and we look at sin, we look at tribulation and trials and challenges in, the, in our, our lives and, and, and we blow them out of proportion and we make God small. But the reality is you serve a big God, bigger than any trial, tribulation, challenge or temptation in your life and you need to believe it. Ephesians 6, it talks about what goes on in the world. Ephesians 6, 12 says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So if your loved one or friend who maybe is influencing you to eat the wrong things, turn to them and say, you're not the enemy. Go ahead. Turn to them and say, you're not the enemy. There is an enemy who is out for you. And this means that every dare to be dumb in the physical realm is rooted in the spiritual realm. Forgetting this may be the reason that you're not able to conquer what is conquering you because you're dealing with it in the physical realm and you're not giving it up to the Lord. You're not praying about him every day in the morning and you're not digging into God's word in a particular area that is tripping you up and troubling you. You need to look to Jesus and his authority and his word and do what he says and believe that you're gonna be blessed as a result. And then you need to look to his people, the body of Christ, other people who are children of God who are good at what maybe you're not good at and maybe God brought them into your life to encourage you to rebuke you, to build you up according to your needs. Remember, there's a proverb, as iron sharpens iron. That's people in your life who are building you up. If your uncle, who went bankrupt three times, went to you and offered you financial advice, would you take it? If your cousin, who was recently convicted on arson three times, offered to teach your kids or grandkids in, in their Cub Scout pack, you know, ha, 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 the responsibility of fire and campfires, would you allow them to do that? No. If you're struggling with alcohol addiction, would you ask a friend with three recent DUIs on advice on how to stay sober? Okay. <clears throat> Wiggle your toes, because they're going to hurt right here. So here's my question for you. Why would you ask yourself what you should do to get healthy if you struggle in this area? If you have a pattern of being conquered by your appetites, perhaps you have to admit that you're not the most responsible expert to listen to. Let me say that again. Perhaps you have to admit that you're not the most responsible expert to listen to. So here's my advice and encouragement to you, if that's the case for you. Number one, go to an expert. Number two, do what they say. Number three, do what they say. Are you with me? Stop listening to yourself. Why? Because you are where you are because you have been listening to yourself. How's your toes? Mine are hurting. Proverbs 15, 22, it says, without counsel, plans fail. But with many advisors, they succeed. With many advisors, they succeed. But why won't we allow others to tell us what to do? Why won't we go ask others who have a strength in a particular area where we're struggling 
Why won't we go ask them? Why won't we go listen to them? Why won't we listen to a loved one who is strong in a particular area where we're weak? I mean, we, we might even live with an expert, and yet we don't listen to them, we don't go to them, we don't learn from them. That's a spiritual issue. Typically, that's pride. It's pride. Some of you, including me, we need to humble ourselves and listen and act on the counsel of others and depend on Jesus to give us the self-control and the humility to listen to them and do what they say and we'll find strength in them. Amen? And then we can conquer what conquers us. Maybe not for 12 months, but at least for tomorrow. I'm going to listen to somebody other than myself who's an expert in this area. And God has provided them in my life. And I'm going to humble myself, kick out pride, and turn this temptation, turn this failure into a strength. You can do it. You can do it. Watch this. I know that was cheesy. <laughs> you can turn your weakness into a strength. You absolutely can. If you humble yourself and follow Jesus, if you make a promise and a covenant to him in a certain area and follow through and allow other people who God has provided you in your life, his word, his people, his presence, the Holy Spirit that dwells within you, and make it happen. So my encouragement is to improve your physical health in 2018. Cut out certain things that are temptations to you. Don't eat after 7 p.m. at night. You'll sleep better. You'll wake up better. Drink less soda and sugary drinks or cut them out completely. Dessert doesn't have to come after breakfast, lunch, dinner, and your snack. <laughs> it really doesn't. You know, once or twice a week, I bet you'll enjoy it even more. For some of you, I know this is a very deep and personal conversation because you've battled this for a long season or different seasons in your life, you've battled this. And it's tough. And, and, and you need to put all of you into trusting God in this area. You need to trust God in this area. Because, you know, if you don't take care of your physical body... You're forcing your loved ones to take care of your future body. Again, that's common sense, but with me, <laughs> common sense isn't very common. I got to be reminded of it. So don't put that on your future, your, your family in the future. Take care of your physical body because it's not yours, it's God's, and you're responsible to the owner for it. Now, I'm excited about heaven, but I don't want anybody to go there before they need to. And I don't need to help that timeline as well. We'll trust God with that. So my double dog dare, here it is. Let's bring it down. The double dog dare this morning is for you to make a 90-day commitment to physical health improvement. To make a 90-day commitment to physical health improvement in 2018. Yes, I'm bringing it. Here's the double dog dare. I'm not asking you to jump out of a plane. I'm asking you to make a 90-day, this is between you and the Lord, to make a 90-day commitment to do something, to take steps towards physical health, to honor him and praise him. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you, God, that you gave us these bodies when you didn't have to. Thank you, God, that you gave them to us for a purpose, to give you praise, to glorify you. And to be a conduit of your love and your grace to others around us. So Father, may we be good stewards of what you have given us for what you own. And may we take responsibility for what you've given us. 
Empower us with your spirit that dwells within us. Be our strength, be our power, be our love, be our self-control. Help us to humble ourselves and trust experts who are truly experts. Help us to not be self-deceived. We're, we can lie to other people, but we are so good at lying to ourselves. Help us to be honest, God, with ourselves. Help us to be honest with you and love you well. This isn't about condemning, it's about praising and about honoring you, Lord. Father, if there are people here who don't have a relationship with you, I pray that they would admit they're sinners, they fall short, that they're not perfect, that they would believe that you sent Jesus to die on a cross for their sins and that they would choose to make Jesus the authority in their life. God, I just beg you that you'd open hearts and minds so that they would be drawn to you and come to you. In Jesus' name, amen.